branded a gold digger. She wasn't liked. Many people thought she was a hard-nosed American out for what she could get. Labeled a ruthless social climber. Delighted. Your Royal Highness. She made an effort always to acquire both money and status. Denounced as an adulterer who plunged the monarchy into crisis. I think she was the most hated woman in the British Isles. For 80 years, Wallace Simpson has been portrayed as calculating and manipulative. Don't worry about me. I know what I'm doing. Loathed the establishment. If she were what I call a respectable whore, somebody who the prince could occasionally see in secret, I wouldn't mind that. And detested by the royal family. She's unsuitable as a friend, disreputable as a mistress, and unthinkable as a wife. But re-examine the evidence, and a different Wallace emerges. A victim, not a villain. If he abdicates, every woman in the world will hate me. A person in Britain will feel he has deserted them. She did not want to give up the throne. She was perfectly prepared to step aside. Emotionally blackmailed by a king. We can't be together. If you leave, I shall kill myself, do you hear? Is that what you want? I shall kill myself! She really did not want to be saddled for the rest of her life with this desperately needy child. And almost destroyed by one man's obsession. She thought this was a harmless infatuation which perhaps might end, and she'd got in too deep and couldn't get out. Based upon private letters, diaries, and personal testimony, this is Wallace Simpson's life from her point of view. People often wonder whether it was a great love story or a tragedy. From her abusive first marriage in America to her second marriage in to London, her chance meeting with Edward, Prince of Wales, and his infatuation that would tear her life apart. I definitely think of her as a woman trapped. I do not think of her as a woman who went out to steal the king. December 1936, on the eve of Edward VIII's abdication, one woman pleaded with him not to give up the throne. That woman was Wallace Simpson. Please, don't do this. It's too late. The abdication papers have been drawn up. Wallace was accused of stealing the king from his country. But unknown to the public, she was desperate for a way out, even at the 11th hour. She didn't want to be the one blamed for this man falling in love with her and becoming obsessed by her. She wanted out, and he wouldn't allow her to leave. He refused, and he kept on refusing. I swear, I'll be gone from this place and your life. Please, don't throw it all away. I can't see all the South Seas, but wherever you go, I will follow you. David, what have you done? She discovered too late that nothing was going to persuade him to, um accept any kind of compromise. Wallace was 40. She was scared, vulnerable, and at the center of the world's biggest scandal. But why did she feel trapped by the king? And how had events spiraled beyond her control? Wallace grew up in the US city of Baltimore, the only child of Tickle and Alice Warfield. But it was her aunt, Bessie Merriman, who had the greatest influence on Wallace and inspired her social ambitions. You're about to become a Baltimore debutante, Wallace. You need to make your mark. Her Aunt Bessie always had great social skills, and all of the family had great social skills, including Wallace. I mean, she was brought up very much in traditional Southern mode, and it showed in her demeanor. What did your grandmother say? How will you ever grow up to be a lady unless you learn to keep your back straight? How? You need to suffer to get what you want. What do you mean? I mean, you must always have a plan. Hm. Aunt Bessie helped raise Wallace when her father, Tickle, was struck down with tuberculosis. Tickle had died young, so he hadn't been able to provide for her. So in those circumstances, Wallace's mother, Alice, had to beg the Warfield family for money. Alice was forced to live on handouts from her late husband's brother, Solomon Warfield. Known as Uncle Sol, he'd made a fortune in the railways. Uncle Sol was very rich, but he wasn't always as generous as he should be. And there's something 
rather awful anyway about having to rely on an uncle um, who doesn't actually have to bring you up, and so you're kind of uh, always a bit at his beck and call. Uncle Sol's money did help pay for Wallace to attend a good school. They prepared their girls to enter Baltimore society. It was here she became best friends with roommate Mary Kirk. So, this is it. I'm packing it all away. <laughs> Mary, did I ever tell you how my mother taught me to swim? Uh-uh. She carried me to the edge of the pool and then dropped me in the water just over my head. Then and there I learned. Sink or swim. Oh, I love Mrs. Astor and Mrs. Vanderbilt. Mary, now is not the time for fools in the trappings of little girls. We need to make our mark. She grew up very much with a sense of wanting to climb to where she felt she belonged. And I think this is why money and financial possessions, possessions of any kind, meant so much to her throughout her life, because she had this sense of deprivation uh, when she was growing up. She felt she was owed them, but she didn't have them. She was trying to ape, to emulate, to be part of that society, but she was just on the edge of it and longing to be included in it. While at school, Wallace was known for her sense of humour, hard work and focus. She wasn't classically beautiful, but she oozed confidence and charm, and she loved to flirt. She liked the guys, and she made no secret of it, and she had sex appeal and was going to use it. And she was catnip for guys. Men loved her, and she loved men. He's asked you to dance three times and you've said no each time. I don't think he'll ask you again. It's fine with me. He's the handsomest boy here. But he doesn't have any money. Shame on you, Wally. Nice girls just don't say that. So what, so no nice dresses? No lovely apartments, not even an automobile? This and Mary, the man I marry will have to have a lot of money. Huh. I think to be really wealthy, not to suffer, what Wallace saw it, the indignity that her mother had suffered by not having enough money, was what drove her. In 1916, Wallace was on holiday with her cousin in Florida when she met Wynne Spencer, a senior flying instructor in the US Navy. <laughs> Win Spencer was dashing and charming and good-looking, and uh, like all bad boys, he had the aura of danger about him. Look at your target. They're breathing in my ear. I know. Well, stop it. Someone might see you. Is any breathing in your ear? Yes, Win Spencer. You're here to help me with my golf swing. Your uncle Sol likes me. Says I have my feet on the ground. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good for him. My mother says an airman's wife has no permanent home, constant change of station, and long nights alone waiting for her husband to return. What do you say to her? I said that's exactly what appeals. Wallace was just 19. Yeah. Wynne was eight years older, far more worldly and mature than the college boys she was used to. He, it was a whirlwind romance, and they married later that year. Not exactly the grand marriage her parents might have imagined for her, but she was probably swept off her feet. My attraction to Wynne is intensified by the glamour and novelty of flying. He and the other officers seem to me to belong to another race of men. Godlike creatures descended to Earth from a strange and adventurous realm. I didn't know how much security she would have thought that she was going to get with a man like Wynne Spencer, but I still think it was more to get away and start a new life than anything else. In her later writings, Wallace said her decision to marry was as much about independence as affection. Although my love for Wynne Spencer was real enough, there also lay in the back of my mind a realization that my marriage would relieve my mother of the burden of my support. I think Wallace was looking to escape the ties of money that she felt were ridiculously um, limiting her choice of action in life by being tied to Uncle Sol. As an officer's wife, Wallace was expected to entertain. She quickly threw herself into the social life. But 
and to her, Wynne was a heavy drinker. Their marriage was in trouble right from the start. <laughs> Wallace later wrote in her memoirs, I was to become aware, before our brief honeymoon was finished, that the bottle was seldom far from my husband's thoughts or his hand. She married somebody who turned out to be an alcoholic who used to beat her. His drinking fueled his violence, and his violence fueled his alcoholism. And you don't have to drink that. Can I help you? Wallace's love of entertaining and Wynne's drink problem were a deadly mix, even in public. Well, I was brought up to believe that one should be as entertaining as one can be at a party. Well, I want to know how you keep these so shiny. I've never, I mean, I've never her husband had a jealous and sadistic streak. And he wasn't afraid to show it. When I am being good, I generally have a bad time. And when I'm being bad, the opposite is true. <laughs> Why not? I... Oh. One can only imagine that the anger and jealousy he felt was fueled by Wallace's natural flirtatiousness. Wynne's alcoholism was a major problem in the marriage, but not the only one. Of course, nobody knows why Wallace couldn't have children. I think probably they were sexually incompatible and that Wynne Spencer found that deeply frustrating and Wallace, of course, being inexperienced, didn't know how to deal with this. For a while, Wallace did what other abused women of the time were expected to do. She put up with it. She tried repeatedly to stop it one night in 1921. What is this? Oh, don't stop. You said you'd cut down. Just cut it, will you? So, so what? Cutting down just means hiding it from me? No. In my book, it means a wife minds her own business. Please, when this isn't doing you any good. I'm not going to be told what to do. In my own goddamn house! I think it was deeply unpleasant, and he was a strong man who wanted his own way. I think you can probably imagine the level of abuse. Wallace was desperate to leave her husband, but in the 1920s, divorce for a woman meant poverty and shame. For now, there was no escape. By 1921, Wallace had been trying for five years to make a success of her marriage to US Navy pilot Wynne Spencer. But he was an abusive and violent drunk. She later wrote of feeling trapped. I had been brought up with the ancient belief that marriage represented ultimate fulfillment for a woman. And the realization that my marriage with Wynne was a failure was more than I could admit to him or to myself. I had to go on trying. Of course, even more difficult to face up to would be the prospect of, of actually leaving him. Divorce was neither cheap nor easy nor straightforward in this era. Of course, it existed. But for many women, remaining trapped in an unhappy marriage was a preferable option because at least being a married woman, that gave them some level of independence, assuming they had money as well. Whereas if they actually went through with a divorce, they were outcasts from society. Divorce? Wallace, it's unthinkable. Wallace could see no way out. In desperation, she turned to her Aunt Bessie. Oh, if you persist in this, you're f uncertain. I am trying to save the lives of two unhappy people. How can you urge me to stay in a relationship that's destroying us both? Being a successful wife is an exercise in understanding. Aunt Bessie, I... You must try again. No. Then agree to a temporary separation. Go away for a while. Let the dust settle. But whatever you do, do not get a divorce. Despite the advice, Wallace still wanted to end the marriage. But turning to her wealthy uncle Sol, he was even more opposed to her plan. And by some accounts, she might have inherited millions of dollars from Uncle Sol. The more I think about the advice of the members of my family, the more it occurs to me that they cannot possibly understand what I'm going through, both physically and mentally. Aunt Bessie's conception of marriage is so absolute as to have no relevance whatsoever to my own unhappy situation. 
By 1922, the arguments with Wynne had become so bad, Wallace knew they had to separate, regardless of what her family thought. When Wynne accepted a posting to China, she chose to stay behind. But two years later, he wrote to her, begging for one last chance. She went back to Wynne, hoping against hope. If they changed country and changed location and changed place, all the problems would be solved. But of course, they never are. You take your problems with you, because you are the problem. Wallace sailed out to join her husband in Shanghai, but the hoped-for reconciliation turned into a disaster. For a couple of weeks, it was wonderful, and they had this amazing second honeymoon. And then he was crueler than ever. He took her to Chinese brothels, or as Wallace called them, sing-sing houses. I'm enjoying this one. For a humiliated Wallace, there was no going back. <laughs> she resolved to divorce Wynne, whatever the consequences. By leaving Wynne Spencer, she was basically saving herself and, and setting out on a new path. And that can't have been at all easy for her, but I don't think she really had much choice. Just as he'd threatened, Uncle Sol cut her out of his will. Wallace would not receive a single cent. It is to Wallace's credit that she thought, no, I am not going to stay in an unhappy marriage where I'm being brutalized and where my soul is being destroyed just to inherit this money. It was 1925, and Wallace was now on her own. Returning to America, Wallace would have to wait another two years to be legally eligible for the divorce. During that time, she met up with her old school friend, Mary Kirk, now married and living in New York. Mary would change the course of Wallace's life. This is Wallace, one of my oldest... Oh, not the O word, Mary, please. I meant dearest. Friends from school. She's just returned to us from China. And this, Wallace, is Ernest Simpson. Delighted to meet you. Your English. Oh, I love your accent. From my father. But born right here in New York. <laughs> I don't think my grandmother ever invited a Yankee into her house. <laughs> Mind you, she also said never allow a man to kiss your hand or he'll never marry you. Thanks for the warning. I'll try to bear that in mind. <laughs> Ernest Simpson worked for his father as a shipping broker. He was a naturalized Briton who'd served in the Coldstream Guards. When he met Wallace, he just separated from his wife after four years of marriage. I think Ernest was completely blown away by Wallace's charisma. It's this ability to enter a room and to have all eyes on her. Ernest and Wallace were different kinds of personalities, but I should think after Wynne Spencer, he was a godsend. Ernest is reserved in manner, but with a gift of quiet wit, always well-dressed and a good dancer. He's fond of the theatre and obviously well-read. He's an unusually well-balanced man. Is he right for me? <laughs> We're poles apart. And maybe that's a good thing. This time. Wallace and Ernest's friendship became a love affair. Although she was wary of becoming emotionally involved, he was impatient. By December 1927, Ernest had a new job in the pipeline and plans for a new life. I've spoken to my father, and it's definitely happening. He knew it was coming. I want to run our London offices. So soon? Come with me. You're free, I'm free, I... we could... In what capacity? Well, as my wife, Wallace, you marry me. Wallace didn't say yes straight away after Ernest proposed. After all, no woman says yes straight away. She wanted some time to think. This was a big decision. She asked her friends what they thought. And after all, she didn't want to make the same mistake twice. Well, if you're having doubts... Doubts are a luxury, Mary. Do you love him? I'm very fond of him. And he's kind, which will make a contrast to you-know-who. 
I think I shall settle into a fairly comfortable old age. <laughs> you sound like you've given up. I just want to be looked after, Mary, and Ernest can do that. I can't go wandering the rest of my life. I feel so tired of fighting the world all alone and with no money. <laughs> Definitely. The best and why the opportunity to start again in London because of his English parentage, and I think she hoped to put the past behind her, to entertain, to make a new life and a new start. Ernest and Wallace moved to England in 1928, marrying in Chelsea on the 29th of July. They moved into a spacious flat at 5 Bryanston Court, just off Marble Arch, taking on a maid, a cook, and a chauffeur. Both were determined to make a success of life in London. Thank you, Cynthia. That'll be all. But Wallace knew they were outsiders. She felt her American confidence and assertiveness might work against her. What is it, darling? I was just thinking about my mother. I do miss her. I'll never forget what she said to me about you. My mother? Just after we got married. She said, oh, now let me get this right. You must remember that Wallace is an old child. Like explosives, she needs to be handled with care. <laughs> <laughs> I can see where you get it from. She always taught me to speak my mind. I think you should be yourself. But well, that doesn't work here. The English women must never forget their second-class status and always remember to bite their tongues. I think Wallace was fairly well aware of the intricacies of the Bushish class system, or if she wasn't when she arrived, she quickly became so. She was very good at sussing out uh, what the form was uh, with those around her. And on the other hand, she did have a natural American frankness, which people seemed to like. And also, because she was American, they would have excused it. Ernest already had society connections from his days as a Coldstream guardsman. But it was his sister, Maud Carr Smiley, who swept him and Wallace into the scene. Maud Carr Smiley had married into the British and, in fact, Irish aristocracy and had made extraordinary inroads into society. So she was really the stepping stone. She was very eager to help her younger brother, Ernest, and his new bride. <laughs> I don't believe you. It's absolutely true. We just got talking, and I told her you'd been teaching me about British history. And she said, well, do you? And I said, well, you badly. Like golf, and yes, worse. And then she said, well, you must come to the house this weekend. And that's when the penny dropped. And that's when the penny dropped. She's Lady Sackville West. And you had no idea you were talking to a fanatical bridge and golf-playing aristocrat? Absolutely not. You're such a liar, Wally. And folks get on in society and establish themselves as interesting people. Ernest and Wallace succeeded. Throughout 1930, their social circle expanded, mixing with the diplomats, bankers, and members of the aristocracy. Those connections would soon change the course of history. They were about to open the door to the most glamorous figure in all of British society. The king's eldest son, Edward, Prince of Wales. Delighted, your will hide us. Nineteen thirteen. Wallace and Ernest Simpson had been living in England for more than two years, mixing with a set of high society friends. In December that year, they met Lady Telma Furness. Although married to a Viscount, she was also the current mistress or favourite of George V's eldest son, Edward, the Playboy Prince of Wales. He rather rejoiced in the nickname of the Playboy Prince. He was young, dashing, intelligent, articulate. All the qualities his father rather lacked, he possessed in spades. He delighted in conducting a vigorous nightclub life and wearing the wrong clothes in the wrong place at the wrong time. He wore sort of fair owl sweaters and open neck shirts and caps on the side of his head, sort of winked to the girls and a lot of nudge nudge, you know. He was the dazzling new thing. He was film star of royalty. He liked anything modern. 
gramophones, dancing the Charleston, wide trousered clothes rather than narrow ones like his father, bright check suits, anything to go against the grain. Edward had courted a string of married women, and Lady Telma was the latest. In January 1931, she was hosting a weekend event at her home in Leicestershire. In order to be seen with her, the Prince of Wales always needed a chaperone for their weekends away, and often the chaperones were different people, so Telma thought one weekend she'd invite her American friend, Wallace Simpson, who was newly married to Ernest. As the day approached, Wallace was suffering from a heavy cold. <coughs> But she wasn't going to pass up the chance to meet the heir to the throne. <coughs> Wallace, are you sure you should be going? After what I spent on hair and nails? <laughs> Come on, Telma. Oh, show me again. So, you put your foot behind you, mm -hmm. and then this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just don't think Americans are built for curtsies. Can I just make him a cocktail? Protocol, Wally. Oh, shush. The prince doesn't give This was an enormous achievement for both Wallace and Ernest, and I think it's really important to understand that at this stage, it mattered hugely to Ernest, who was a snob as far as he was concerned. To be introduced to the Prince of Wales was the pinnacle of his achievements. He was terribly proud of that. For the Simpsons, the day was memorable, but for the wrong reasons. When introduced to the prince, known as David, to his family and friends, Wallace was typically forthright. I told you, like a darn freezer. <laughs> You're always skimping on the fires. Stiff upper lip means frozen upper lip. <laughs> David, this is Mr. Ernest Simpson. Be sweet, you. And Mrs. Wallace Simpson. Oh, no, please, please. <laughs> Delighted, your royal highness. My goodness. Your hand is like ice. You must be missing your American central heating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, sir, but you disappoint me. In what way? Well, every American woman who comes to your country gets asked the same question. I'd hoped for something a little more original from the Prince of Wales. We're not so cosseted over here. We rather enjoy a bracing blast. Now, I do hope you enjoy your weekend. Why did I say that? He famously addresses this remark about things with central heating and all that sort of thing, and she was quite provocative with him. Wallace feared she'd overstepped the mark. <sighs> you can imagine what a treat it was to meet the prince in such an informal way. I hope I didn't upset his sensibilities. In my experience, it is important for an American woman of my generation to be a bit different. Or, in any case, interesting. Oh, well. I doubt we shall see or hear of them again. But the Simpsons did get to see Edward again. Just a few months later, Lady Telma invited them to her house once more. And this time, Wallace was determined to make a better impression. Ah, haven't I met this lady before? Cold hands can't curse it. <laughs> <laughs> I trust you are acclimatizing to our chilly lives free from central heating. <laughs> yes, indeed, sir. Oh, the fox furs and cocktails do help. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Wallace was surprised and flattered the prince had remembered her. She was keen to get to know him better. Maybe we can invite the prince over for a cocktail one afternoon. Are you out of your mind? Oh, you're right. We have to build up to it gradually. I didn't mean that. It's best to do it through Telma. He's the Prince of Wales, Wallace. Why on earth would he want to come to us? In fact... Ernest had underestimated the calendar, and in June that year, they were even presented to the king. Now, this is extraordinary for a divorcee to be presented at court, and it was only because of Telma encouraging Wallace and Telma even lending Wallace her clothes that she was able to be presented to the king. Following the ceremony at Buckingham Palace, the couple bumped into the prince again. By now, Wallace was bold enough to extend an invite. Mrs. Simpson, what a delightful gown. But, Your Highness, I understand that you thought the lights made us all look ghastly. <laughs> I had no idea my voice travelled so far. Please, allow me to make it up to you. Could I offer you a lift home? Well, thank you, that would be perfect. Would you like to come up for a drink before continuing on? I'm afraid I have an early start in the morning. 
but I would very much like to see your flat one day. I'm told it's charming. It might give me some ideas to brighten up the fort. <laughs> if you'd be so kind as to invite me another time. Of course. Please. But six months later, it was Edward who would extend the invitation. In January 1932, he asked them to a weekend gathering at his own home, Fort Belvedere in Windsor Great Park. The atmosphere at the fort was one of resolute frivolity. Everyone was there to have a good time. Well, here we are, darling. <laughs> This being your first visit to the fort, I thought I'd tell you the rules. There are none. <laughs> Stay up as late as you want, get up when you want. David, I feel like dancing. Put on a record. <laughs> Wallace represented something very fresh. She wasn't deferential. She was witty, she was charming, she was sparkling. She was great fun to be around. It had taken 12 months since they first met, but the Simpsons were now part of Edward's inner circle. We need some expert help here. Darling, you are urgently required at the jigsaw puzzle table. Aha! Uh -huh. There's something I've been meaning to ask you. Yes? Mrs Simpson. Could I interest you in a game of Red Dog? <laughs> that sounds like a cocktail. <laughs> and what would a Red Dog cocktail taste like? Well, I'm sure I don't know, Your Royal Highness. Wallace and Ernest had got their wish. They were now at the pinnacle of London society. They must have felt like the cat had got the cream. I mean, they were right in the centre of the most interesting part. Me and do not curse this poor attempt at thanks in verse. Our weekend at Fort Belvedere has left us both with memories dear of what in every sense must be princely hospitality. <laughs> but just as they reach the top of the social ladder, the Simpsons' finances suffered a dramatic downturn. The Great Depression of the 1930s was tightening its grip, and Ernest was feeling the squeeze. No, the shipping industry certainly suffered, and Ernest was constantly short of money, to the point where actually they thought they couldn't afford to keep on the flat at Bryanston Court. Ernest took out personal loans from his company, but his reserves soon ran dry. He tried to rein back the couple's spending, but that led to tensions between them. The real problem that Wallace faced was not whether or not she could fit into this group and make her mark within it, which she certainly did. The real problem was finding the money to pay for it, to reciprocate. And, of course, that was something that, on Ernest's income, they couldn't begin to do. Why did you do that? Because having a chauffeur is simply one luxury too far. I've given him his notice, and that's that. But think how it will look to everybody. I thought you didn't give a damn about convention. We don't want to change our way of living now that we're all installed and meeting new people? Well, yes, but... What? We're going to have to cut back on the soirees. <sighs> For God's sake, Wallace, join the real world. You know what's going on out there. We're not the landed gentry like your new pals. You may not have noticed that I'm out all hours working. People's businesses are collapsing left, right and centre. It's affecting everybody. Yes, and us too. Despite the rows over money, the couple kept up their efforts to remain part of London society. They continued to throw raucous parties at their flat. Edward was a regular visitor, often entertaining other guests long into the night. He liked to play the bagpipes and kind of march in and out of the rooms doing that, and it wasn't probably exactly what everybody expecting, but I'm sure it was all huge fun. Although the prince was still seeing Lady Thelma Furness, their relationship was starting to peter out. He was getting bored. 
and she knew it. The prince was fundamentally fickle. For Telma, the timing couldn't have been worse. She was about to travel back to America to be with her sick mother, leaving Edward on his own for months. What's the matter? Come on, tell me. I think the prince is losing interest in me. Don't be silly, Telma. You're still the Princess of Wales. <laughs> He's going to be lonely while I'm away. Wallace, won't you look after him? See, he doesn't get into mischief. Oh, he'll be busy. Busy missing you. But of course, Telma, I'll look after the little man. Telma made the great mistake of asking her good friend Wallace to, to protect her interests and entertain the Prince of Wales while she was away. God, talk about folly. In Telma's absence, the Prince's relationship with Wallace changed dramatically. Even though he counted her husband as a friend, he was clearly attracted to her. They had interests, genuine interests and connections on a human level that neither one had realized before. And Wallace's great gift with him as well was he could speak about things to her and she listened and she responded. I am curious, Your Highness, to know what a prince's working day consists of. Really? It'll just bore you. On the contrary, I couldn't be more interested. Imagine having to make a thousand speeches and never once being allowed to say what you really think yourself. That must be very difficult. Modern age needs a modern monarchy. I just find myself frustrated and blocked at every turn. Mm -hmm. No, Wallace. You're the only woman who has ever shown any interest in my job. <laughs> of course, Edward lap this up. It's wonderful for him. And he finds in Wallace somebody who's deeply and totally sympathetic and prepared to listen however boring it is, however much time it takes. In her memoirs, Wallace would later recall this moment as a turning point. It was as if a door had opened on the inner fastness of his character. What I now saw in his keenness for his job was not dissimilar to the attitude of many American businessmen whom I had known. I sensed in him something that few around him could have been aware of. A deep loneliness. Soon Edward would... He fixed upon her with an obsessive compulsiveness that swept everything else aside. In 1934, Prince Edward's mistress, Lady Telma Furness, went on a trip to America. He immediately switched his attentions to her friend, Wallace Simpson. Over the next few weeks, Edward attended a series of dinners and parties at the apartment Wallace shared with her husband, Ernest. As they got to know each other, he used to love going round to their flat and having drinks and things, and he felt very sort of comfortable and happy there. The Simpsons had once both craved the prince's attention. But now, Ernest was starting to tire of constantly entertaining him. Was that him, again? Yes. The little man is coming over. I have so much work to do tonight. Can't you put him off? Certainly not. Just excuse yourself at some suitable point. The prince won't mind. Are we really the only people who can entertain him? Well, don't you think he deserves a little place where he can just be himself? You talk about him like a, a bird with a broken wing. What's got into you? <sighs> It's a very difficult thing if the Prince of Wales's eye falls upon your wife. What do you do? Do you, you know, do you prevent her from being his friend in any sense at all? She would have been much more difficult to take up with if she had not had a complacent husband. And so, in a way, Ernest Simpson was a necessary part of the picture. Due to heavy work commitments, Ernest would often leave Wallace to entertain Edward by herself. There was gossip but she insisted they were merely friends. I am not in the habit of taking my girlfriend's bow. Prince and I are together a lot, and of course, people are going to say things. I think I do amuse him. 
and the comedy relief, and we like to dance together. But I always have Ernest around, so all is safe. But Edward saw it differently. Lady Telma had been away for two months. As soon as she returned, he made it clear their relationship was over. I'm sure she intended to resume her position as before, but by then, of course, Mrs. Simpson had become much closer to the Prince of Wales, and unfortunately, such was his way that once somebody disinterested him, he just iced them out. He was not kind to her. He didn't let her down gently. He suddenly tells his telephone operators, no more phone calls are to come through. She's, she's just immediately um, removed from the scene. In Telma's place, Wallace had become the new object of the prince's affections. Edward now started to invite... There were also lavish days at the races. But at Buckingham Palace, his relationship with Wallace was causing the king and queen concern. They thought she was a vulgarian, a commoner, an American. Hard to say which of those was worse. And, of course, were horrified by the fact that she'd been divorced, because if you were divorced in those days, you would not have got asked to the palace. Make sure Mr. and Mrs. Simpson are not invited to any Silver Jubilee function. And I don't want to see them in the royal enclosure at Ascot. The king thought Wallace had an extraordinary hold on his son and heir. Not surprisingly, he was suspicious of her. They assume she must be someone who's interested only in what she can get and in money. They absolutely fail to understand actually that it's Edward who is the needy one in this. They made it perfectly clear that they didn't want to have anything to do with her. She follows no protocol except the protocol of a gold digger fresh from the colonies. She's unsuitable as a friend, disreputable as a mistress, and unthinkable as a wife! In spite of his father's opposition, Edward's feelings for Wallace grew deeper and more visible. He showered her with expensive clothes and jewellery. To everyone in his close circle, it was obvious she'd become the prince's new favourite. I can find no good reason why this most glamorous of men should be seriously attracted to me. I am certainly no beauty, and he has his pick of all the beautiful women of the world. Maybe onto my American independence of spirit. Who knows? What a bump I'll get when some young beauty appears and plucks the prince from me. Anyway, I am prepared. I don't think that Mrs. Simpson ever really thought that whatever actually happened... She thought when she'd be dumped, because that's what happens to royal mistresses. But there was no breakup. In summer 1934, Edward invited Wallace on a holiday cruise aboard the Rosaura yacht. With Ernest on business, she was joined by her now 70-year-old Aunt Bessie. Arriving home, Bessie gave Wallace a... Prince is rather t with you, isn't he? What makes you say that? I see the way he looks at you. Well, I'd like to think he is fond of me. If you let yourself enjoy this kind of life, it's gonna make you fearless, unhappy with everything else. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm having a marvelous time. Don't worry about me. I know what I'm doing. It's your own way. But wiser people than you have been carried away with such opportunities. I see no happy outcome. Whatever her denials at the time, Wallace had moved into uncharted waters. In her memoirs, she recalled... Perhaps it was during those evenings off the coast that we crossed the line that marks the indefinable boundary between friendship and love. But in the months following the cruise, the prince's relentless pursuit of began taking its toll on Ernest. He was a husband staring an affair in the face. It's not an easy thing to have these sort of triangular relationships. No, it's all very complicated and, um, you know, the Prince of Wales was rather used to getting his own way. Isn't it wonderful? David's invited us to go skiing. Skiing? I've got business in New York. But it's all arranged. I can't very well back out now. So that's it. You've made up your mind to go alone. Uh, can't you see what an opportunity this is? I feel like I'm Wallace in Wonderland. More like Never Never Land with Peter Pan. I thought we might have gone to New York together. I see now I was wrong. It's not particularly nice being London's most celebrated cuckold, which is what he was. But he just had to take it. 
I mean, he certainly never bleated to anybody about being cuckolded. I mean, you don't think in terms of being a cuckold. You know, it's it's the mark of a cad, not a gentleman, to speak about being cuckolded. At the same time, the prince was becoming more needy and demanding. He started writing childlike love letters referring to W.E., Wallace and Edward, and he grew increasingly jealous of having to share Wallace with her husband. Oh, a boy does miss and want a girl here so terribly tonight. I do hate and loathe the present situation, and I'm just going mad at the mere thought, thought let alone, alone knowing that you are alone there with Ernest. God bless W.E. forever, my Wallace. You know your David will love you and look after you. He fixed upon her with an obsessive compulsiveness that swept everything else aside. Wallace was protective of Ernest. She felt the prince was coming on far too strong. David, dear, I was and am still most terribly upset. One can't go through life stepping on other people. You only think of what you want and take it without the slightest thought of others. She argues with him. She says, for goodness sake, understand this I'm married to. By the end of 1935, Wallace's attempts to keep both men happy had grown more difficult. But it was at the start of the new year that matters would come to a head. On January 16th, George V fell seriously ill. Edward Travel died. His Majesty the King passed peacefully away at a few minutes before 12. He whom we loved as king. Wallace? It's all over. David, I'm so very sorry. I can't tell you what my own plans are. Everything here is so very upset. But I shall fly to London in the morning and will telephone you when I can. Godspeed, David. God save the king. I suspect that is the last time we shall be hearing from him. I think she thought it would end now because it would no longer be acceptable for her to be the mistress of a king. But it doesn't happen like that because actually Edward's need for her is greater. It's pathological. It's obsessional. Edward tightened his grip on the woman he loved. As he prepared to be crowned king, he was determined that Wallace should be his queen. Wallace. Britain was about to be engulfed in crisis. If the government is opposed to our marriage, then I am prepared to go. By January 1936, Ed, Prince of Wales, had become besotted with Wallace Simpson. He bombarded her with gifts and obsessive love letters, even though she was still married to her husband, Ernest. When he Father George V died, the prince inherited the throne. The faith According to ancient tradition, the news of the accession was read out in public. God save the king! Edward had invited Ernest and Wallace to watch the ceremony with him from St. James's Palace. As Ernest stood in the background, Wallace had a front row seat. Do you have a good view? Costumes are so fancy. <laughs> Like a pack of cards. All this. Your life is going to be very different now. Of course it will. Nothing will change my feelings for you. But David, everything around you is going to change. Can't you see that? The scrutiny, the expectations. Nothing will ever be the same. Edward and Wallace had been in a relationship for at least a year. But the British public knew nothing of it. Edward's friend, press baron Lord Beaverbrook, had persuaded Fleet Street to suppress the story. But for the select few who were in the know, Edward had made a terrible misjudgment by being seen with Wallace. They included Tory MP Duff Cooper. And here is the extract from my father's diary about the proclamation. This is just the kind of thing that I hope so much he won't do. 
It causes so much criticism and does so much harm. Already people are beginning to talk about her and to criticise him. If she had been a single American girl, they would have viewed it quite differently. But it was the fact that she'd already been divorced and she was married to somebody else. Now as king, Edward's need for Wallace grew stronger than ever. I've had to be at the new king's beck and call, being the only person he really has to talk things over with. And I am implored on all sides not to leave him, as he is so dependent on me and I'm considered to be a good influence. But it is quite seductive to her when people start telling her that she's actually quite a good thing, that Edward is now a reformed character, that he's disciplined, that he's turning up for meetings on time. And she thinks, well, maybe I could have a role to play. But Wallace was leading a double life. Amidst the excitement of being so close to the new king, she still had a husband. She was becoming increasingly torn. David is lonely and needs companionship and affection. Otherwise, he goes wrong. Ernest has, of course, been marvelous about it all. He has the makeup of a saint and far too good for the likes of me. But by March 1936, Ernest couldn't bear sharing his wife any longer. While Wallace was away in Paris, he went to confront the king, accompanied by his friend, the Reuters news chief, Sir Bernard Rickerston Hatt. Edward's response stunned them both. Does she know you're here? Of course not. Far more expedient to decide this between us. It seems quite clear to me. She can choose between the two of us. Sit down, Bernard. I want you to hear this as well. What are your intentions towards her? You sound like a dowager aunt. I only have her interests at heart. And you think I don't? How can you? Tell me this. Do you intend to marry her? Do you think I'd be crowned without Wallace by my side? Listen, Ernest, we both want the same outcome. Security for Wallace. Give her a divorce and I promise to stand by her no matter what. Now, old man, do we have an agreement? Ernest had no idea the king had plans to marry his wife. He was torn between loyalty to the throne and a sense of pride in his own wife. And um, when it came to the point, he, he really put loyalty to the throne first. The husband, if he's a gentleman and his wife is prepared to have an affair with the king, the protocol is that he steps aside. Wallace found out about the king's demands as soon as she returned from France. Ernest, and she didn't want to marry David. She wanted to keep the status quo. She wanted to be Mrs. Ernest Simpson, mistress of the Prince of Wales, then of the king. But the king had made his decision, and Ernest felt powerless to fight it. Wallace, too, could find no way of changing Edward's mind. Over the coming weeks, she began to accept that divorce was inevitable. I have been under a most awful strain with Ernest and His Majesty for the past year and a half. It is not easy to please, amuse, and placate two men, and to fit into two such separate lives, which is what I've been trying to do. Ernest will find his feet. He is a strong and noble character and a wonderful friend to me. And I feel he should have the chance to find happiness again. Ernest moved out of the couple's London flat in the spring of 1936. But in recently unearthed private letters sent at this time, their continuing deep feelings for each other are evident. My dearest Wallace, I think something in me quietly died when I closed the door of the flat for the last time this evening. I have no tears, tears left to shed. I know that somewhere in your heart, there is a small flame burning for me. Guide it carefully, my darling, and don't let it go out. If only in memory of the sacred, lovely things that have been. Someday, I pray God will fan it into a blaze again. And bring you back to me. Too late. Ernest and Wallace recognize what they've lost and what they've thrown away. In Wallace's desire to reach for the stars, she's burnt herself. She's reached for too much. And I think she realizes that too late, that she's spoiled the relationship she had. With Ernest gone, Wallace felt she had to move on. She started spending more time at Fort Belvedere the king's private residence in Windsor Park. Over the coming months, their love affair now blossomed. 
but was still kept secret. Edward wouldn't be satisfied until they were man and wife, and their relationship made public. It's got to be done. Sooner or later, my Prime Minister must meet my future wife. Oh, David. This idea. They can't stop me from marrying you, Wallace. Oh, stop it. I've said it time and time again. I know for them the idea is impossible. Rest assured, my darling, I will manage it. Persuade the establishment. And he was doing little to help his case. There are certain rules as to how monarchs are supposed to behave. And Edward VIII did not obey those rules. Official government papers sent to the king would often return with ring marks over the pages where cocktail glasses had been set down on them. <laughs> and both Edward and Wallace often spoke freely about private government business, causing damage and gossip. The king often asks me to read him government papers from the dispatch box. It helps him unravel what's going on. She's right, you know, it is all so dreadfully complicated. But I've said to him, he's the one who has to master the points in them, not me. It's all right, my darling. I'll soon have it all down, tickety-boo. <laughs> I know you <laughs> sweetheart. The careless table talk soon reached the ear of the Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin. The relationship between the government and the palace was particularly important at this time because it was a time when the general population upheld the royal family as guardians of British virtue and decency and duty. And these were things which Edward was not embodying. And there was a fear that his antics could start to undermine the credibility of the royal family. And with it, the, the, the backbone of British life, society and government. Baldwin's own fears were so great he took an unprecedented step. He ordered Edward and Wallace to be spied on. I'm concerned about the King's relations with Mrs Simpson. If it becomes generally known, the country won't stand for it. Please. If she were what I call a respectable whore, you know, somebody who the prince could occasionally see in secret, I wouldn't mind that. But this is... And you know, talking to him is like talking to a ten-year-old boy. He doesn't seem to grasp the issues at stake. He seems almost oh, bewitched. I have never in my life met anyone so completely lacking in any sense of the beyond. <laughs> he asks Special Branch to start following her, to checking up on people with whom she's, she's met, she's spoken with. The investigation revealed some disturbing findings about Wallace's social circle. Some of Wallace's friends were known to be at least sympathetic to the far right in Britain and even in Germany. For Baldwin, this was enough. He began the amount of sensitive information that went before the eyes of the king. But by then, Edward and Wallace were also under surveillance by the media. Their affair was about to be exposed to the world, and Wallace's life would be torn apart. I am plastered all over the papers, accused of the most awful things. I... Can't you see? We can't be together. In August 1936, took Wallace and a group of friends on a cruise of the Adriatic Sea. The British press kept to their self-imposed code of silence, but the sight of the king cavorting with Wallace in flannel shorts and no shirt was gold dust to the foreign media. The story of the relationship was about to go global. The international press made hay with this. You can't imagine a better story of an unmarried king with his girlfriend who's still at time is married to someone else and uh, it, it was a public relations disaster of, of the worst kind <coughs> following the cruise Wallace was laid up in bed with a heavy cold she only learned of the newspaper reports from a set of clippings sent by her aunt Bessie the American press had whipped up a royal scandal and blamed it all on her she hadn't really faced up to the appalling social consequences that would ensue from her relationship with the king. And um, I think when it did happen, her first reaction was, oh, my God, uh, what do we do about it? And, let that, and I think quite genuinely, let, let's call it a day. This, this is all too damaging, too difficult. 
Don't let's go on any further. Panicked by the coverage, Wallace pleaded with Edward to end the affair. Have you seen what they're saying about me? It's so awful for words. I'm... Some cheap dinner table conversation. David, we can't go on. I just wanted to end. Don't be silly, darling. It's... I am plastered all over the papers, accused of the most awful things. I, I can't do this. I'm going back to Ernest. Have you lost your mind? It was better with him. It's safer. What are you talking about? I shan't stand for it. I need you here by my side. David, can't you see? We can't be together. You and I can only create disaster together. I shall never give you up. Never. Darling, please. Be realistic. You know I sleep with a gun under my pillow. Oh, David, stop it. If you leave, I shall kill myself, you hear? Is that what you want? I shall kill myself. I think if we're looking at what how Wallace felt at this point, she was almost distraught at how it had played out. She really did not want to be saddled for the rest of her life with this desperately needy child. She thought this was a harmless infatuation, which perhaps might end, but would be very nice while it lasted. And she'd got in too deep and couldn't get out. Events were now moving quickly. Shortly after the... Away from the king and depressed about the continuing hostile gossip, she once again begged him to reconsider their future. David, dear, this is really more than you or I bargained for. Do you still want me to go ahead, as I feel it will hurt your popularity in the country? Isn't it best for me to steal quietly away? I can't help but feel you will have trouble in the House of Commons and may be forced to go. I can't put you in that position. I feel like an animal in a trap. There are many instances of her writing to him saying, please, please leave me, please leave me. It's not going to be good for you, it's not going to be good for me. I'll be, I'll be hated forever if I, you know, and, it, and it's just not going to work. And he just wouldn't leave her. The day before her divorce, Wallace felt she'd lost control of her life. She was in turmoil. I really can't concentrate on anything at the moment. I've had so much trouble and complications with everyone. And I feel small and... Licked by it all. I can't think what sort of a mess I'm leaving for. I feel sorry for myself. I feel sorry for the king, and I don't understand myself, which is the cause of all the misery. She was being propelled and catapulted in a direction that she did not want to go into. On October the 27th, Wallace was granted her decree nisei. Although it would take another six months for the divorce to be finalized, Edward's plans to marry her gathered pace. But now their relationship came under even closer government scrutiny. The wife of the king becomes the queen, and therefore the person whom the king marries has to be acceptable to the people. Now, who determines whether the king's wife is acceptable to the people? The answer is the elected government and that was represented by the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin. And Baldwin took the view from the beginning that she would not be acceptable as Queen. If the government didn't like who the King wished to marry, they always have the option of resigning en masse and forcing some sort of constitutional crisis. As opposition to the marriage mounted, Edward's secretary, Alec Harding, took soundings from establishment figures. He then wrote to Edward, saying the government would absolutely not accept Wallace as Queen. Wallace! Wallace! Something rather serious has happened. I had intended to keep it from you. Read Harding's letter. It's utter impertinence. He says the government is meeting to discuss us and that I should be warned of constitutional implications. She's rather a good American expression. They're going to give me the works. I, I think he's trying to do the right thing. He's warning you that the government will insist that you give me up. They can't stop me, Wallace! I will marry you. If fighting, then it will just mean tragedy for you and catastrophe for me. I am going to send for Mr. Baldwin to meet me at the palace tomorrow. If the government is opposed to our marriage, then I am prepared to go. Edward had realised that he was going to have to choose between Mrs. Simpson and country. And there was absolutely no flick of doubt in his mind that his choice was going to be Mrs. Simpson. She wanted out and he wouldn't allow her to leave. He wouldn't allow her. He refused, and he kept on refusing. Everything is going wrong and more wrong, and I'm very tired with it all. 
Knowing David as I do, I am doubtful that anyone, including me, can change his mind. But if I stay and my pleas fail, I will always be accused of secretly urging him to give up the throne. She was sensible enough to see it was a very rocky road ahead. And, and I think she genuinely did not want to marry him. Having been warned of the looming constitutional crisis, Edward summoned Prime Minister Baldwin to Buckingham Palace. Neither man was prepared to give ground. The government would not object to you having a, a mistress, but we cannot countenance you marrying her. Now, I would suggest we go ahead with the coronation, and then perhaps you would have some time to reconsider. Prime Minister, I cannot entertain such a proposition. I would be crowned with a lie on my lips. Then I'm afraid I see only three ways of finding a resolution. You finish your relationship with Mr. Simpson and remain king. You marry her against the advice of your government, which would then be forced to resign. Or you step down from the throne. The king did not have many options. Baldwin said, you can either give up Wallace Simpson and stay king, or you can abdicate. I've made up my mind and I will not alter it. I will abdicate and marry Mrs. Simpson. Edward's decision was unprecedented. The British newspapers could no longer keep quiet. On the 3rd of December, 1936, the affair between the King and Mrs. Simpson finally made the headlines. And the press verdict on Wallace was damning. Have you seen this? Yes. It's not good, is it? <laughs> good. <sighs> You've seen the letters I've received, some of them threatening all sorts. I feel like a hunted animal. I had no idea it would be anything like this. I think we just have to hold our nerve. You don't seem to understand. They're not just attacking you personally. David, it's still not too late to reconsider. I'm begging you. It's impossible. I can't change what's in my heart. This was the first time the British public had heard of Wallace Simpson, let alone that their king was intent on marrying this American divorcee. I think she was the most hated woman in the British Isles and seen as a wrecker, a destroyer, a thief. Wallace is a terrified woman. She gets poisoned pen letters, and every time she opens the door, she finds a posse of photographers, of paparazzi waiting for her, and she thinks whenever a flashbulb goes off that this is someone about to take a pot shot at her. Unable to cope with the open hostility, Wallace had to escape. I imagine it'll be some time before we're together again. You must wait for me, no matter how long it takes. I shall never give up. Never. Wallace fled Britain to stay with friends in France, hounded by the press all the way. I think she made a tactical error in leaving because once she left, David could do exactly as he pleased and did. Wallace's Aunt Bessie had been visiting her niece when the news of the affair broke. In spite of everything, sir, are you really determined to marry my niece? I am, Mrs. Merriman. Even if it means giving up the throne. I cannot, with a full heart, carry on my duties in this loneliness that surrounds me. Wallace will be blamed, perhaps even more than you. Her reasons for going away, I am sure, are to make it easier for you. How can separation make things easier? You can always marry someone else. But if you step down from the throne, you can never again be king. He made it perfectly clear that if the price he had to pay to have her was his throne, he would pay that price without any hesitation at all. Edward was keen to explain his predicament to his subjects, but protocol demanded he needed the permission of the Prime Minister. I want to appeal to my people, a radio broadcast, perhaps. Tell my side of the story. But such a broadcast would be impossible without the consent of the cabinet. Every single utterance your royal highness makes must be on the advice of ministers who would then take full responsibility for every word, and that will not be forthcoming. 
Now holed up in the south of France, Wallace was in despair. The attention from the press didn't let up, and the poison pen letters kept coming. The letters I receive are so cruel. I said to David, it is too heavy a burden for me to carry. The British people are absolutely right in not wanting a divorced woman for a queen. If he abdicates, every woman in the world will hate me. And every person in Britain will feel he has deserted them. She didn't want to be the one blamed for this man falling in love with her and becoming obsessed by her. Wallace made a full desperate phone call to the king, but once again, he refused to let her go. Listen to me, David, please, don't do this. It's too late. The abdication papers have been drawn up. Cabinet met twice today, and I've given them my final word. I will be gone from England in 48 hours. David, I'll leave. I swear, I'll be gone from this place and your life. Please, don't throw it all away. I don't seem to make you understand. You can go where you want. China, Labrador, or the South Seas. But wherever you go, I will follow you. David, what have you done? She discovered too late that she had become involved with the most obstinate man in Europe and that nothing was going to persuade him to um, accept any kind of compromise. At long last, I am able to say a few words. On the 10th of December, 1936, Edward signed the instrument of abdication. The following day, he was allowed to address the people of Britain and the Commonwealth. That I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king, as I would wish to do, without the help and support of the woman I love. After just 11 months on the throne, King Edward VIII's reign was over. He and Wallace would now become outcasts. With the UK gripped by a constitutional crisis, Wallace Simpson had begged her lover, King Edward VIII, to leave her and remain on the throne. But he insisted he couldn't remain monarch without her by his side. Following his abdication, Edward was made Duke of Windsor by his brother, the new king, George VI. He left England and stayed with friends in Austria, separated from Wallace until her final divorce papers came through. Wallace remained in France, hiding from the press, ground down by the events of the previous months. I have fallen back exhausted by the struggle to prevent this great tragedy. I feel so small in failing to make him stay where he belonged. And now the world has turned against me because I fought a losing battle. She didn't want to be... Recently discovered letters revealed that Wallace was an emotional wreck. Even as she contemplated her future with Edward, she wrote to her ex-husband, Ernest, still showing such strong feelings. Dearest Ernest, I wake up in the night and think I must be lying on that strange chaise longue and hear your footsteps coming down the passage of the flat. And there you are, evening standard under your arm. I can't believe such a thing could have happened to two people who got along so well. Make your life again with care. You are so good and sweet. My dearest love to you, Wallace. It was a very tangled web, and I think what the letters reveal is a lot of fear, a lot of vulnerability, a lot of greed, all the human emotions, but too late, Wallace recognised that actually Ernest offered her the real sort of love that she craved. In May 1937, Wallace's divorce was finalised. Edward immediately travelled to France to be with her. A week later, they listened to his brother's coronation together. I, George VI, I do solemnly and sincerely... I can feel the drawbridges coming up behind me. I've taken you into a void. Oh, David. Let's look for a house in Paris. I don't want to go back to England while... While Bertie's finding his feet. You must have no regrets. I have none. What I know of happiness is forever associated with you. 
I don't know if she actually looked forward to the marriage, but I think she'd begun by now to realise that it was completely inevitable because what else could she do? Once he gave up his throne for her, she felt honour-bound to marry him. As their wedding preparations got underway in France, Edward and Wallace realised just how cut off from British society they'd become. It was made pretty clear in that way the establishment has that it was not a good idea to go to that wedding. At least he might be allowed to marry her in England. He wasn't. And then he hoped when he was going to be in France, he still hoped that some members of the family would come, and none did. So it was a very sad, disappointing affair. I mean, my heart really does go out to her, you know. She hadn't asked for all this. In a further snub, the royal family decreed that despite the upcoming wedding, Wallace would not be granted the title Her Royal Highness. Wallace! They're not giving you the HRH. Why in God's name would they do that to you? We know your family doesn't approve of me. Here, it's this bit. I hope this painful action that I've been forced to take will not be considered an insult. Well, it blasted well is an insult to you and to me. The worry on the part of a royal family in Britain was that after all, she'd had a pretty rackety past. Suppose this marriage didn't last, and she was starting to flaunt her Royal Highness title around American nightclubs with all sorts of unsavory people. I think he was shocked and horrified to find the extent to which he was ostracized, in which it was made very clear to him he would not be welcomed back. On June the 3rd, 1937, the full extent of the establishment's ruthlessness became clear. Only seven guests came to the wedding of a man who had been the King of Great Britain and ruler over a quarter of the world. He found a dodgy clergyman who was prepared to come out and perform the wedding, and there were just a handful of friends, and it must all have been extremely depressing. If they ever needed any um, evidence as to how things were going to be in the future, they certainly got it that day. There is a sense in which an empty chasm yawns. What, what on earth can they do with their lives from now on? At the outbreak of World War II, Edward was made governor of the Bahamas. But when peace came, he resigned, and no further official position was offered. He and Wallace returned to France, setting up home in a rented mansion in Paris. For the next three decades, they effectively lived in a self-imposed exile. He could have come back any time he wanted, but he made it quite clear that he would not come back unless his wife was made a royal highness and received by the king and queen that this was recorded in the court circular. And they did neither of those things, so he stayed away. And he went on staying away for the rest of his life, basically. Cut off from British society, Wallace had to invent a new life with Edward. She used to say his day had been managed from he was a baby down to the last second. All of a sudden, there were no private secretaries, Aquaries, lady clerks, there was this tremendous void. And she had to create a way of life for them that filled these voids and filled his diary. And Wallace did just that, coming up with a plan that would take the world by storm. She realized that her and Edward had marketability. They were at the center of what became known as the greatest love story ever told. In the 1950s, both the Duke and Duchess published their memoirs. These became instant time. It was on their terms. They became fashion icons, invited all over the world as guests on the A-list celebrity circuit. She dressed beautifully with all the best designers, and, I mean, books and books have been produced about the Duchess as a woman of style. She was a master of telling couturiers how she should look. I think she was a very great influence on clothes at the time. And, of course, American magazines loved her. They were their royalty. After transforming herself and her husband from shamed outcasts to style icons, Wallace had at last found the fame and adulation she desired. Darling, I only ever look left. I don't suppose you know who Marilyn Monroe's publicity agent is. I have all the newspapers each day, and I see she's pushed me off the front pages. Still, we'll soon be back on top. They ended up having a very glamorous life, and it gave him something to do. And this was, in any event, the life that she had been born 
to and brought up for. And she simply had it on, in some ways, a rather more famous level than she would have had it had she remained Mrs. Ernest Simpson. Just as she had learned to do as a child in Baltimore, Wallace always made a memorable entrance and a lasting impression. She could not have been more polite. She took the trouble to remember my name, which was extremely unimportant third secretary. It was very flattering. She just appeared at the, our table and she said to me, Hi, I'm Wallace. I always curtsied to her as well as to him because I was of the view that she was Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Windsor, irrespective of any ruling to the contrary. She talked and talked and talked about that. She told me the whole story of the whole application. And I thought, my God, I must remember this. I'm getting this out of the horse's mouth. You know, this is absolutely extraordinary. It's wonderful. Of course, I'm far too drunk. I remembered absolutely nothing the next morning at all. But the Duke and Duchess's new lease of life arrived late and didn't last long. In the late 1960s, Edward was diagnosed with throat cancer. He died in Paris on the 28th of May, 1972. After the Duke died, the maid and the uh, butler both said to me she was very lost. She'd become extremely dependent on him. She was so used to having him around. Where else would she have got that level of adoration from? Dear, dear David, my own sweetheart. A girl and a boy used to be so happy together. God bless W.E. forever, we used to say. Edward's body was flown to England to be buried alongside his family at Frogmore in Windsor. After 40 years and... But it was an awkward royal welcome. Wallace, of course, is invited but she still felt herself a complete outsider. She didn't feel any warmth. In the years after Edward's death, Wallace grew frail. She suffered from dementia and was often heard talking about the abdication, as if she was living through it all over again. We can't be together, David. You and I would only create a disaster together. David, listen to me. Don't, please don't do this. People will say that I could have prevented it. Isn't it best that I steal quietly away? She was kind of cast into a sort of abyss, in a way. She was, uh, had lost the purpose of keeping things going for him, and it all kind of fell apart. Her position is hopeless. For you to go on fighting the inevitable would only mean tragedy for you and catastrophe for me. She didn't have any family. She didn't have any children. She didn't have any close friends. She just had a few hangers-on. In 1975, Wallace suffered a severe internal hemorrhage from which she never fully recovered. The last 10 years of her life were as a virtual prisoner in her own home. On the 24th of April, 1986, Wallace, Duchess of Windsor, died, aged 89. I don't think Wallace died a happy woman. I think if she looked back on her life, she felt a sense that she hadn't quite fulfilled the promise she made herself as a young girl. She was honourable and decent, and, you know, she made the best of a bad deal and made as good a job of it as she could. She was taken up by this man who really was not up to her standards intellectually. I think having three meals a day with the Duke of Windsor must be an absolute nightmare. I suppose, ultimately, I do think it's sad that she didn't aspire to achieving something on her own terms, ultimately always playing second place to a man. He was the open sesame to a new and glittering world that excited me as nothing in my life had ever done before. I sought no place in history, but would now be assured of one, an appalling one, carved out by blind prejudice. After the break, we're headed to Leeds, where Marvin Humes and Maya Jama are getting ready to host the biggest night in the urban music calendar, the Mobo Awards 2017.
December 1936, on the eve of Edward VIII's abdication, one woman pleaded with him not to give up the throne. That woman was Wallace Simpson. Please, don't do this. It's too late. The abdication papers have been drawn up. Wallace was accused of stealing the king from his country. But unknown to the public, she was desperate for a way out, even at the 11th hour. She didn't want to be the one blamed for this man falling in love with her and becoming obsessed by her. She wanted out, and he wouldn't allow her to leave. He refused, and he kept on refusing. I swear, I'll be gone from this place and your life. Please, don't throw it all away. I can't see all the South Seas. But wherever you go, I will follow you. David, what have you done? 